Okay, that was beautiful. <laughs> I thought I had a few more minutes. <laughs> Genesis, today we are reading from the first book of the Bible. Um, for those of you that have been following us consistently on Facebook Live and Zoom, this is our third Sunday in Genesis. For those who have been coming to our lectionary Bible study, this is their fourth Sunday. I encourage all of you to come to our lectionary Bible study, which is held at 930, and it goes over the text that generally we're going to expound upon in service. But it's a wonderful opportunity to get to know the Bible a little bit deeper and better. And we have a really, really phenomenal, phenomenal retired professor, Jay, who teaches that class. So I want to encourage you, if you can, on Sundays, uh, visit us in Zoom land and visit our Sunday School Bible School. Today we are reading from Genesis, the, 32, the 32nd chapter, verses 22 through 31. If you're one of those people, I encourage you to go back and just read the whole book this week. It is rich, it is rich, it is rich with our story, and it is rich with the Israelite story. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket because he struck Jacob on the hip socket as the thigh muscle. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word. Today I'd like to use as a sermonic theme, I'm a survivor. I am a survivor. Eva Hart, mom, had a foreboding sense of their trip that was coming up that she could not. To call a ship unsinkable was flying in the face of God to her mom. But her husband overrode her fear and on April the 10th, 1912, her dad, her mom, and she at seven years old boarded the brand new illustrious, I mean illustrious, illustrious, luxurious Titanic. The Titanic was part of the White Star Line and was their effort to compete with Cunard. The Titanic was a beautiful, luxury British steamship, and more than 100,000 people came out for its launching. The Titanic had first-class accommodations and was designed with a pinnacle of comfort and luxury, with a gymnasium, a swimming pool, libraries, high-class restaurants, and opulent cabins. Remember, this was 1912. Some of the wealthiest people were on this ship. This ship bragged about being unsinkable, which maybe is why they only had one third of the lifeboats to preserve only, I mean, they only had enough lifeboats to preserve one third of the people that were on the ship. There were four days of uneventful sailing. They stopped at different ports and picked up people. They were headed to the United States of America. But on that fourth day, at 11.40 p.m. at night, the ship hit a little jerk, 
It didn't seem like nothing much if you're someone that cruises. The ship jolted a letter. But it was notable, noticeable to Eva, Eva's heart's mom because her mom had determined she would not sleep any night. And so she slept during the day and every night was awake all night. When she felt the slight jerk, she bugged her husband and said, go up to the deck and just check it out. He felt a little frustrated with her because she was really going overboard with this whole worry about this unsinkable ship. But when he returned, he asked them to get ready immediately. He covered his daughter in a blanket. They left their room. They proceeded up to the deck and were put on a ship. In the beginning, they only were allowed to evacuate women and children. And so at that moment, Eva and her mom said goodbye to their dad and their husband. And they were moved away. Eva Hart and 704 women and children became known as survivors. The ones who two hours later were rescued by the rival ship Cunard. Eva Hart is a survivor. This is where we enter the biblical text today. Jacob is a survivor. He has survived the loss of his father. He had survived the anger of his brother. He had survived swindling his brother two times. He had survived running away from home so that he wouldn't get killed. He had survived being promised one bride and getting another. At first glance, it seems impractical that he would be struggling in the night with a supernatural being that some call a man or an angel or even God. Here he is. <clears throat> and he can't get any rest on this night. He seems like he's greatly disturbed. But actually, what you don't see in the text today is that Jacob was about to meet his brother. His brother had sent word that he wanted to see him. His only brother, Esau, the one that he had swindled out of his inheritance, the same brother he had swindled out of the blessing that went to the oldest son, the same brother who was so upset with him, his mom sent him away. They had not seen each other in over 20 years. Jacob had fled for his life because his brother was so furious with him. And now his brother has sent word that he wants to meet with him. And so Jacob is scared. Jacob is really, really scared. And that night, he has this dream where he is wrestling with a supernatural being. So Jacob was scared of what his brother might do to him. Isn't it very interesting how those who wreak the most evil, the most harm, the most doing other things to other people, then worry about the things they do to other people being done to them? A spouse cheats on their partner, and then she or he gets the notion that the other spouse is cheating on him or her. No proof. And so she, de he decides to put a camera in the car of their spouse because they want to catch them doing what they've been doing liberally. She or he sets it up and she or he travels unaware until one day their leg hits something and they discover that their spouse has put a camera in the car. But this person is not cheating. Where did the spouse get the notion from that their spouse would be cheating on them? You see, whole people have been harmed and mutated and killed, and yet they lean into forgiveness, and it stifles the enemy. It stifles the one who has done the harm, and they don't know what to do with it. And so Jacob is in distress because Jacob fears what Esau will do to him. It's like when you eat that big, big, thick hamburger and it just doesn't settle at night. It is not so very odd that Jacob struggles all night, given this context, the night before he's to meet his brother. Dreams engage our uninhibited conscious or unconscious thoughts. And Jacob was now face to face with a past he had not fully dealt with and the weight of what he had done resting heavily on his shoulder. He had burned some shim bridges for sure. And he was not only struggling with this supernatural being, but he was struggling with himself. He was suddenly looking at the man in the mirror. And 
He doesn't have to because plenty of people run away, but Jacob stays. He stays right there in the midst of the struggle. He's convicted by his behavior in the past. He remains in the eye of the storm and a new day appears. And he declares, I won't let go until you bless me. We wrestle with things. We wrestle with why it looks like sometimes evil prevails. Have you seen any of those adventure movies lately? They are ending darker and darker. We wrestle with a country that is wrestling with the economy over human lives. For those of us who love God and God's creation, that makes absolutely no sense. We wrestle with God and sometimes discern where is God in all of this. We wrestle with that. Where are you, God? We wrestle with legislation that would seek to send people back to places they fled for fear of their lives. And if you're thinking that Chicago looks bad, we ain't got nothing on the cartel. It makes Chicago look like heaven. And that's sad. We wrestle with family members who sometimes we love, but we're not headed in the same direction as they are. And while we want to be whole and well and heal, sometimes our family members want to keep up a little bit of drama. We wrestle with aging and diminished abilities to operate independently. And like Jacob, we wrestle with things we did in the past that we have not yet made peace with as we come full circle in our lives. And it is in this quietness and stillness of night when our body lays horizontal that our stuff finds us in the middle of the night and it wrestles us and it won't let us have good sleep. But how many of us declare like Jacob, I won't let go? I am not going to let go until you bless me. Eva Hart was plagued with nightmares of the Titanic after she lost her mother at 23. You see, she lost her dad at seven years old, and then in the prime of just being a young adult, she lost her mom. And she couldn't shake that awful night and the loss of so many lives. She couldn't shake what had happened on the Titanic. Her mom would spend hours on the next ship looking for her father to no avail. And so Eva also found herself struggling. She confronted this struggle by actually booking a ship, a ticket on a ship that was headed to Singapore. She locked herself in the cabin for four days and she was petrified and she struggled. And then someone on the ship, an employee, came down to the cabin and got her. See, she had to face her own struggle, too. She knew she would never be free until she boarded another ship. And on the fourth day, when the walker brought her up to deck, she felt, she says, a freeing of her soul. The nightmares left her, and she made it to Singapore. I hope that America will wrestle with itself. I hope that America will wrestle with its past. I hope that America will wrestle with its present condition. Not only to think that we were once great, but that maybe we could be great now. I hope that America will wrestle with the sin of racism in this country. I hope America will wrestle with the awareness that the pursuit of liberty, justice, and happiness found in our Declaration of Independence is not available to all. I hope America has the audacity and courage to do the right thing. I hope that America will wrestle with its past. This week I learned of a boys' reform school in Florida that was opened in the 1900s. January 1st, to be exact, and it closed in 2011. At Dozier Reform School, boys were beaten and raped. A college in Florida recently, a couple years back, excavated a plot of land and found over 80 bodies. The survivors are speaking up, 
and they are telling their story. Interestingly enough, the people in this town are like, it wasn't that bad, they're defensive. And they're trying to hush up the story from emerging. Because what does that say about me and my town? These guys said this school messed up their life. They left mean and angry and got into more crime. But I did find one guy amidst them all who left and made something of his life. He went on to become an established entrepreneur. To be clear, what happened to those boys should never have happened. And sometimes what happens to people in life should not happen. And yet there are other things that happen to us that are just a part of living. Good and bad and horrific things happen to all people, no matter how religious or non-religious you are. But we are survivors. Right now, we are survivors of COVID, and we are survivors of other things. And as survivors, which to me is anyone that is breathing, we are going on to live our lives. For Jacob, he struggled. He showed us it's okay to struggle, but I'm not going to let go until somebody up here in this joint blesses me. He wasn't afraid to face struggle and duke it out and be in God's or whoever's face. And he shares his wealth with his brother as an atonement. He apologized to his brother. He admits that he did wrong, and he doesn't say but. He just simply says, I was wrong. He doesn't shuck away from the responsibility. Jacob has grown so much that he even gets a new name. He's called Israel. Just apologizing can do much to help people heal. But sharing wealth, reparations can do more. And Jacob took what he had and he shared. He showed us an example of what reparations really looks like, what it's all about. Toronto, Canada apologized to the Native Americans. The former president of South Africa apologized for apartheid. Germany apologized to the Jews. The former prime minister of Australia apologized to the Aborigines. Jacob shared with his brother, I was wrong. And here's some cattle and some animals because I have been blessed. And part of my blessing came off of swindling you. I mean, let's just keep it real. The best apologies simply are to confess that we are deeply sorry and we are deeply remorseful. As survivors, we can live in the shadow of what has happened to us, or we can struggle and bust free. Sometimes when people act real crazy, I read their memoirs, because I'm like, okay, something happened that they didn't get free from. <laughs> so, you know, I started reading about Clarence Thomas, because, and I knew something happened to that brother, <laughs> and he didn't get free. I'm getting a little off. <laughs> we, as survivors, do not have to be defined, according to Maya Angelou, by what happened to us. My grandmother had this big yard. Well, the yard still exists. I mean, it's so big, it looks like it's hard for my family to even care for it. But in the country, people have big yards. They look like they're miles long of beautiful green grass. I invite you to be survivors that even regardless of what has happened in your life, what you have been through, that you have a big yard full of love, a big yard full of peace, a big yard full of grace, John Lewis says, hate is too big a burden to carry, and yet some of us try. The other day, like many of you, I had uh, cleaned up and I had a big bag of stuff, and I was trying to carry it and I could barely pick it up. And it took someone of stronger means to pick it up. And yet some of us as survivors are carrying around stuff that is heavy and burdensome. As survivors, we can be in the eye of the storm and ask God for whatever we want. As survivors, we can be racist or we can choose to consciously be anti-racist. As survivors, we can draw boxes around ourselves or we can see our struggle as one that links us 
with the human race. As survivors, we can say we are not going to let go of God until God blesses us. What an awesome statement. Okay, God, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. Two years ago, I was recovering myself and sicker than a dog, but I found myself out on New Year's Eve night for some reason, and the music was going. And then they played that song, I'm a Survivor, and I mean people hit the dance floor. And I was out there, and we were like jamming, and I was like, wow, there's a whole lot of survivors. <laughs> I'm not the only survivor. There's something about this song that resonates with us. We are survivors, but how we choose to live our life, well, that is on us. Eva Hart was one of 705 survivors, and with her life, she became a strong activist and actually was awarded. She lived into her 90s, and for all of her living, she spoke out about what happened on the Titanic is unnecessary and a human display of man's arrogance. Eva Hart vividly remembers what happened on that night. As a survivor, she remembers being out on the water. She remembers that the boats had to move out. And I didn't know this because you can be pulled in by the suction of water if you're close to a boat when it's going down. And so the boats that did escape, they were moving out to put distance between them. She said, I never closed my eyes. I didn't sleep at all. I saw it, I heard it, and nobody could possibly forget it. And I can remember the colors and the sounds, everything. The worst thing I can remember are the screams, the sounds of people hollering. And then it seemed all at once as if everything was gone drowned, finished. The whole world was standing still. There was nothing but this deathly, terrible silence in the dark night with the stars overhead. And she said, before the ship went down, the band played one last version of Nearer My God to Thee. She said, there are three versions, but they played the one that was played in churches nearer my God to thee. And Eva Hart said she never closed her eyes. She saw that ship sink. And she saw that ship break in half. We, in some way or another, are all survivors of one thing or another. Live your life with as much pizzazz and boldness and love. And if you feel so inclined, get on the dance floor and proclaim that you are a survivor. Amen. <laughs>